please warmly welcome Mr. Greg Dutcher up here. Thank you, Joe. Hey, good evening, everybody. Great, great. Whoa. Wow. It's the Holy Spirit moving right through here. Um, really, really great to be here. I was told I have slides that I can see, but they're not going to come up on the screen. So what I need everybody to do is just move up here. And if you could all get around my iPad. No, don't do that. Um, that would get really strange and very hot and uncomfortable very, very quickly. Um, great, great to be here. I love this theme. I love the whole theme that you're going to be doing all summer. Uh, I love this particular theme. In fact, when um, the guy sent it out to some of the uh, potential uh, speakers, I, I looked at that one and said, man, I think that's the one I want to do. For one, it's, it's very personal. I want to talk about uh, this concept that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that might sound strange, uh, fearfully made. What, what does that mean? It sounds like one of my high school chemistry classes when I was in a lab and I had to do experiments and is it biology where you dissect earthworms and cats and stuff like that? Wow, that's a great educational system, traumatized children, never let them go back in the classroom again. Um, you know, uh, it, it interests me, this concept of making things, it interests me even more that we have been made. I was um, 19 years old, I have to this day, a debilitating fear of spiders. I hate them. I'm convinced that um, they, they did not exist before the fall of man. I'm trying to prove that scripturally. Um, I think they were cute puppies at one point, and then Adam and Eve fell, and they became spiders. That's what I'm trying to prove, but I found no verses yet. And here I am, and uh, just about getting out of the shower, and I'm looking down in the, uh, in the uh, drain there, and I am convinced it's one of those big furry wolf spiders. You ever see those? You know, those things that just move like, hey! Um, so here it was, it was down there and I, I, I'm getting close to it and I'm rolling up this like, you know, uh, toilet tissue to see if I can get close enough just to, to squash it. And, and as I get close, and I'm really manly when I'm doing it, like, ah, oh, <laughs> and I'm like, look, yeah, looking down. And I'm about to, and I realize it's not moving. And normally spiders can sense it because they're evil creatures that, <laughs> that you're about to do something to it. And, and I, I lean close down and realize that's not a spider. It's a chunk of my hair. Um, I'm not making this up. I am 19 years old. And I honestly thought a little bit of my recently departed hair follicles that it was a wolf spider. That's a very strange moment when you're not 29, when you're 19. And uh, you guys may not notice this, I am bald. Um, I don't know if you noticed that before. I, I tell people I just have a wide part going right down the center. So I had an action plan very, very quickly. I'm 19, I'm going totally bald, find a beautiful girl, get married fast, and trap her for life. That's exactly what I did found her very quickly. I trapped her. She said, I do. I said, honey, you have no idea that you're going to be able to see your reflection in my head for the next 50 years. So, you know, I'm, I'm 19 then, and I'm concerned about what many of you are concerned about, and that's image and body type and all that kind of stuff. And look, there's no doubt at all that our culture has, it changes from year to year and decade to decade, but there's always a certain body type that um, you know, the culture tells us is the body type that you need to have to be validated as a fully authentic person. Uh, so of course, 19, losing my hair, put me out of that category as I saw it, and I was very, very fearful. And um, I went to high school with a friend. I've lost touch with him now, but I just want to give you this brief little intro to set the stage here. Uh, he, was, uh, he was kind of an overweight kid, nicest guy you could ever meet. Uh, I'm going to call him Brian. I don't think there's any way that anybody would know this person. He's out of state now. Uh, he was brutally picked on elementary school, middle school, high school um, because of his weight. Nicest guy you could ever meet. And uh, then by the time he was graduating college, I saw him at a high school reunion, and this guy was just, just shredded ripped. I mean, he had just completely remade his entire image and he was ripped fuel. I mean, he came into this place, and everybody's looking at this guy, and it's incredible. Well, he gets married 
Uh, he has a couple of kids. This is a true story, and, and, and it's a tragic one. I don't want anybody to think there's a joke coming here. There's not. He gets married, has a couple of kids. As is common, uh, women will often put on some weight. They need to do that. They're sustaining a life force within them. Uh, and his wife gained a, a few pounds, as is, is common, when a woman is pregnant. And um, all of a sudden, she no longer met his standard. All of a sudden, he was very discouraged in telling people in his life that he was very, very unhappy about what was happening to his wife. In fact, this guy, Brian, became one of the most judgmental people you could ever meet. Every person he laid eyes on, he instantaneously assessed like RoboCop or something as to what their weight was, what their body mass index should be, and found himself disgusted with people that were overweight. So he grew up with a body image problem, being mistreated for the way he looked. He solved the problem by fixing his body image, but he never solved anything. I would submit to you that my friend Brian, before he lost the weight, after he lost the weight, never had the proper understanding of, of the fact that he was fearfully and wonderfully made from day one. Let me prove that to you in Scripture. Psalm 139, verses 14, 15, and 16. Listen to what the psalm says. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When he says fearful, he doesn't mean he looks in the mirror and says, ah! It means he is in awe, using fear in that reverent sense. He's in awe of the fact that God made him as he did. He says, wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame, that is his body, was not hidden from you, God, when I was being made in secret. So he's talking about when he was inside of his mother's womb, being knit together, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet... There was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. This is a man who is looking in the mirror, but he doesn't stop there. He looks upward at God, and he draws an important conclusion that I just want to spend a few minutes with you on tonight, that he's fearfully and wonderfully made, as are you. Let me just pray for our time very briefly. Father, I want to thank you for everybody here tonight. My prayer is simply that no person within the sound of my voice tonight, would be deceived to think that they are here by accident. I pray, Lord, that you would convince each person that they are here because your providence has dictated every detail of the last 24 hours, the last week, the last month, the last year perhaps, to lead them to this particular moment. There's nothing special about me, but there's always something special, Lord, about your word when it's being proclaimed. And I simply pray that you would grab everybody's attention. You would, as it were, speak to each person personally. I pray right now, Lord, that, that you would do battle for us. I know the enemy of our souls, the devil, wants to distract us, wants this message to just fall on deaf ears. Lord, unless you work, we will not change. So would you do the work that only you, by your Holy Spirit, can do in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's David, the author of this psalm, and he concludes something about himself. We don't, we don't know what the guy looked like. You know, I have no idea what the guy looked like. But he concluded that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And it had nothing to do about cultural standards. It had nothing to do about how ripped he was. It had nothing to do about what his conditioning was, what his BMI was. It was entirely based on the fact that God made him. Now, in Genesis 1.1... Uh, we learned that in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. If you were here last week, that's what Ryan talked about. I want to point out something he may or may not have covered, but it's going to lead in well to tonight. I'm going to give you four things that God made, and then there's a comment about each one. Here it is. God saw that there was light, and that was good. That's number one. And then the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. So make seas, oceans. And God saw that it was good. So notice that it was good. And then he makes trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. So you've got all these trees. And you've got maples and oaks and you know, redwoods and all these trees that he makes. And he says, oh, that's, that's good. And fourthly, every winged bird according to its kind. So you've got all these exotic birds. 
And he said that it was good. Every single thing he makes, he says it is good. And then I want to give you what I consider the crowning achievement of the things that God made. Then God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, one other verse in here, one other verse, that summarizes it was very good after mankind was made. But then the text backs up a step and tells us that Adam, first man, was made first, and this is the first time in the story that something is not good. God says, behold, it is not good for that guy to be alone. So he makes him a partner. Makes a woman named Eve. And then he says, ah, not just good, but very good. I would submit to you that according to the book of Genesis, and the first three chapters in Genesis, you, mankind, is the crowning achievement of God's creation. Now that's a bold statement. Because you should have seen me when I woke up this morning. My hair was a mess. It was just going every which way. You know, just windblown, okay? But the, the, the gunk in my eyes, right? I mean, I'll just tell this about myself. You know how it is. You look in the mirror, the, the, the yellow on your teeth, the, the, the sort of grungy, filmy substance you seem to pick up just by sleeping in a bed for eight hours. All this stuff that you see, and I am here to tell you that you, as a human being, according to God's word, are the crowning achievement of his creation, even though all those things I just described, those less pleasant things are true. That means that something as breathtaking as the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls or a gorgeous sunset that you see somewhere out in a campground in Western Maryland or a sunset, that whatever you see pales in comparison to a human being. Because God says when a human being was made, it was very good. There's one other detail I want to give you from Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it yet to rain on the land. There was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. So you've got this beautiful tropical paradise that is created, but there's no dude living there. And then God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature now you just heard joe summarize ryan's message from last week and what was that god spoke and stuff that wasn't there got there that's mind-blowing god spoke and things that didn't exist came into existence. So I would argue that by this time in the story, we should conclude that if God wants to make you or me, he could simply speak it and it would come into existence. Men, women, all over the earth. But he doesn't do that. He could do that, but notice what it says. The Lord God formed the man from dust from the ground and breathed life and he became a living soul. He did not do that for the sun. He didn't do it for the moon, didn't do it for the stars, didn't do it for the oceans, didn't do it for the birds. He did it only for human beings. Handcrafted. This is God putting his stamp of authenticity. Now, oh, I want to take my friend Matt Smith's message, who's going to be preaching next week, but he'll be mad at me if I steal it. So I'll try to say one or two things in just a moment. Let me give you a quote from a PhD in biochemistry. The guy's name is Dwayne Gish. He's written this. There's no evidence, either in the present world or in the world of the past, that man has arisen from some lower creature. He stands alone as a separate and distinct created type, endowed with qualities that sets him far above all living creatures. I love to take my kids to the zoo. Because for the first time, I feel like they're looking at what our life looks like at home. They're looking in cages. And they're seeing animals tear things apart, making a mess of everything. I'm like, that's what you boys do every single day. So they are just wide-eyed in states of wonder looking in at all these exotic creatures. And I love to tell them, we look at these giraffes with these ridiculously long necks. And it's the freakiest thing you've ever seen. 
They're like, that, that is just weird. That neck is just so weird. I mean, it's long. It's, it's, it looks like a treat. It's crazy. And we talk about that. And you look at how ridiculously large these hippos are. And you think of the noxious odors they produce. And, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at all these creatures. And, and you look at these gorillas and these monkeys. And, and you look at these tigers. And you look at these polar bears. And, 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 and the kids are fascinated by it. And I always wait till we get in the car. And I say, you know what, guys? You guys, you guys are more exotic, more interesting, more special than all those creatures. And they say, no, we, we don't feel like that. I say, it's true. That's what God's word says. That's why over and over again, the Bible is telling us things like this, Psalm 100. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We already read Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Notice that handcrafted picture again. It's not just that God speaks and we pop into existence. Oh, that's good for the sun and the stars and the oceans, but it's not good enough for his crowning achievement, which is mankind. Let me give you another cool scientific quote that I think you'll think is interesting. I'm not a science guy, so when I'm fascinated by something like this, I think the, the science people must be going crazy. This is cool. Suppose we were going to make a human body. This is what we would need, right? This is what you need to go to Home Depot and get. We would need 58 pounds of oxygen, 50 quarts of water, 2 ounces of salt, 3 pounds of calcium, 24 pounds of carbon, some chlorine, phosphorus, fat, iron, sulfur, and glycerin. We bring the items home, so much dust and some water. There it is, our do-it-yourself kit for making a human body. The only problem is, of course, the instructions. The human body is so complex, an entity that no scientist can comprehend more than a fraction of its composition and functions. Now listen to this. A mere piece of skin the size of a postage stamp on your body requires three million cells, one yard of blood vessels, four yards of nerves, 100 sweat glands, 15 oil glands, and 25 nerve endings, one postage stamp of your skin. Yet the evolutionists would ask us to believe that blind forces of chance produced our bodies. It would be simpler to believe that Webster's unabridged dictionary resulted from an explosion in a printing plant. <laughs> I love that quote. The human body, marvelous and intricate as it is, eloquently testifies to the wisdom and power of God. The evolutionist preys on our gullibility, but the Bible leads us to worship leads us to worship. Because you, you look at this one little posted sandwich, are you kidding me? This is what it requires. Nobody could make this. I mean, our greatest minds, our greatest scientific minds, our researchers, our biochemists, our biologists, our chemists, our engineers could not come close to making anything like this. But you young guys and gals in particular are told all the time that you're the wrong body type, you've got the wrong kind of hair. Uh, one of my daughters has gorgeous, long, kind of wavy, curly hair. She always wants it straight. Her cousin has just beautiful, long, straight hair. She wants it wavy. It's constantly, we're, we're looking to improve this thing that we think is bad when all the time the Bible is saying it doesn't matter if you carry extra pounds, if you're skinny as a rail, if you're tall, if you're short, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And nobody can take that from you. So you can clap for that. Praise God. Nobody can take that from you. It just, it just can't be taken. The culture will try to take it from you, and that's where we need to kind of put it back in their face and say, you can tell me all day that I need to be this or I need to be that. God has already told me I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am the crowning achievement of his creation. That is mind-blowing. God formed us, formed us from the dust of the ground. He fashioned us. This is intricate design, master craftsmanship, which means I, I've talked to kids before that. I'm sure, it, it's at some of you guys here, yourselves or friends that are cutting that are bulimic, that are anorexic. Usually when you peel back all the layers of the pain and the depression and the sadness, 
What it really comes down to in its most fundamental sense is will you believe what God says about your body, how you were made, is true or not? It's really a matter of who you're listening to. One last thing, and this is where I steal a little bit from Matt's message from next week, and I'm, I'm almost done. I just hang with me a couple more minutes. Mankind is the only created thing in all of the account of creation that has this stamp called the image of God. Even the angels in heaven that are awesome creatures. I always love to preach about angels because if I had a slide, I'd show you the typical angels that come to my mind. They're little chubby, little baby angels. <laughs> little precious moments angels. And I, I would love to put those angels in like a biblical movie where the shepherds at Christmas are on a hillside and when they see angels, they fall to the ground like they're going to die. Basically, do you realize an angel always has to say one thing when he shows up? Don't drop dead. I know you want to. I know you're terrified. And I just think it would be so good to put those reactions in these little chubby little babies. <laughs> oh, my word. They strike terror into my soul. Angels in the Bible are fierce creatures. L look, every single time they show up, they say, fear not. Because the implication is, you know, people are peeing their pants, basically. <laughs> I mean, angel shows up and you're not like, oh, can I, can I get you a latte? It's like, you basically say, would you please not kill me? Angels, as awesome as they are, are not made in God's image. Animals are not made in God's image. Only mankind is said to be made in the image of God. That's Pastor Matt Smith's message next week. I'll give one quote from a guy like John MacArthur. who says this, The image of God is personhood, and personhood can only function in relationship. The image of God is the capacity for personal relationships, and most importantly, for a personal relationship with God. When God said, let us make man in our image, he introduces to us, at that point, the concept that he is a God of relationship, and then creates us in that image so that we are creatures of relationship. That is true of nothing else created. Only we can be in the kind of relationship God envisions with himself, because we bear that image. Now, Pastor Matt will unpack that next week. Just a couple more things very quickly. Another great dude, Augustine, 400 or so AD, said this, men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains and the huge waves of the sea, the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motion of the stars, yet they pass by themselves without ever wondering. Walk by the mirror every day. Oh, it's just boring old me. Yet God put such an investment into us. Now, I want to end with a little story, and you're going to think this is a strange way to set it up. It's a story from the gospel. First, I want to say, because I've told this story before, and it was taken home wrongly. If anybody goes home, I will hunt you down. I will get all your addresses, and I will show up, and I will say, shame on you. Is that intimidating? Um, God is not for cruelty to animals. I've told this story before, and people got the wrong idea. I want to stress that our God is not in favor of cruelty to animals. Two passages that prove it. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. See, a greedy landowner will put a muzzle on the ox because if it's got a muzzle on it, it can't eat some of the grain that it's treading out. God says, Don't, and you realize that God actually cares about the ox? He says, Don't put a muzzle on that animal. He's providing sustenance for you. Let him eat some of it. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, the prophet Jonah doesn't want to preach to his enemies because he's afraid they'll, they'll repent. He doesn't want some of God's grace to spill upon the undeserving. So he is terrified about that, and he doesn't want to preach. And God ends the book by saying, Should I not pity Nineveh, this city, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from the left? And then he says it's the weirdest verse in the Old Testament to me. And also much cattle. That's how the book ends. It's like, there's 120,000 people and there's a lot of cows. All I can tell you is this, God cares about cattle. He, he, he's moved to compassion for it. Now, that's my backdrop. Let me tell you this story. 
Mark chapter 5, verses 2 and through 13. It's a really cool encounter. Jesus steps out of the boat. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with a demon, an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. I mean, what can you imagine this poor guy's existence? It's like lives in a graveyard, basically. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he would tear the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. But when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of God, the Most High God? I adjure you, I mean, I beg you by God, don't torment me. And Jesus said, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And the demons begged him, saying, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. See, these demons know exactly who Jesus Christ is. They've known him for thousands of years. And there he shows up one day and they're like, you've got to be kidding me. He's here on earth. And they are terrified of his authority and his massive power. And notice the text says this, So Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out of that man and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about, listen to this, 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, I, I want to establish, we've already seen that God cares about animals, but do you realize one human being made in God's image, was more important to Jesus Christ than 2,000 animals. So he sent those pigs to their death because one man was lost and tormented. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God. He was the one the book of Colossians tells us, the book of Hebrews tells us, that was with the Father and the Spirit creating all those awesome things Ryan talked about last week. And when he decided to come to earth, I want you to think about this. He didn't come as a, as a tree. He didn't come as an animal. He didn't come as a rock. He didn't come as an ocean. He didn't come as a cloud. Oh, Disney movies are made of all that kind of stuff. He chose to become what? A human being. Fully God, fully man. The book of Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. You have been made by God fearfully and wonderfully. And you were made so that this Jesus Christ, who saved one man and was willing to slaughter 2,000 animals for that one man, wants to enter into a saving relationship with you. To forgive you of your sins. To free you of your bondage to sin and idolatry and self-love and self-worship. And he is not ashamed to call you his brother or sister. So I would urge you, do you know Jesus Christ? He is the one who made you. He is the one who came seeking you. He is the one that can set you free. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, when the eternal Son of God came here, he became human. So how could we not be amazed at the marvelous, intricate, exquisite design of the human being? But may, Lord, we simply look at that beautiful design and then look upward to you and say, I want to know the God who made me, which is only possible through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you for him. Amen.